My name is Chris, and I'm an associate professor in computational biology in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. And I'd like to tell you a bit about my group's research in developing and using automated systems to perform scientific research. My group is developing closed loop systems to perform scientific research. We incorporate three different kinds of technologies into our work. First, we use robots to perform wet lab experiments and automatically generate data. Second, we use machine learning to interpret those data and automatically generate hypotheses. Finally, we use artificial intelligence in order to select the next round of experiments so as to improve our hypotheses or when we're in an engineering context to improve an underlying design. You might be asking yourself, is closed loop scientific research even feasible? And the answer is yes. And in fact, it's been practiced since the year 2004 when Ross King's group in the United Kingdom introduced a robot named Adam. Adam was the first robot scientist. And by robot scientist, we don't simply mean the use of robots to move samples from one place to another or to automatically uh, take pictures and things of this nature. Adam does all of those things, as you can see in this picture. But what's more impressive is that Adam also automatically interpreted the data it generated and then selected the next experiments. The human's uh, only role was in the actual design of Adam itself. Adam made some novel discoveries. In particular, it was able to determine the biological function of several genes within a particular species of yeast. These were truly novel discoveries in the sense that the function of those particular genes was not known until Adam proved scientifically what they were doing. The Adam robot demonstrates that it is possible to automate scientific research, at least in some cases. Your next question might be, well, why should we automate scientific research? I think there are three high-level answers to this. Number one, if we use robots, we could potentially save money, time, and space because robots can run 24-7, 365 days a year. Robots are often faster than uh, their human equivalent. And robots are often physically smaller, meaning you could put more of them in a given space. Additionally, by using robots, we can hope that the resulting quality of the data will be higher and that the overall reproducibility of the experiments will be higher as well because we can literally log absolutely everything that the robot has done. That is not really possible with human beings. And you may be familiar with recent articles that um, discuss the challenges associated with reproducing published scientific research. These papers are not suggesting that there is wide scale, uh, widespread fraud in science. Rather, they're talking about the practical issues of logging what humans actually do in the lab. With robots, we can log absolutely everything that they do, and if we ever need to rerun the experiment, we can do so with high precision. But perhaps the most important reason for automating scientific research, in my mind, is that living systems are incredibly com complicated, and there are fundamental limits to what the human mind can keep track of and reason about in a self-consistent fashion. Computers, on the other hand, have far fewer limitations of these sorts because they can store very large amounts of data and through algorithms, they can reason uh, about the consequences of uh, various experiments. If you would come to my office, you would see on the wall this poster of known biochemical pathways. And I use this sort of as a reminder of how complicated living systems can be. And this is just the biochemistry of your sort of generic cell. The point of this is that if you were to make any modification 
to any part of this system, it would be hard, even for an expert, to um, correctly reason about the consequences at the level of biochemistry, let alone the consequences at the level of cell biology or at even higher scales. Through automation, we hope to extend the boundaries of what is uh, learnable uh, through scientific experimentation. Adam was first introduced in 2004. Since then, there have been tremendous advances in the automation of scientific experiments. Indeed, today, it's fair to say that almost anything you could imagine doing in a wet lab has already been automated. It's just a matter of purchasing the hardware. What's more, there's an emerging industry of providing laboratory services in the cloud in much the same way that Amazon provides computing services in the cloud. As a particular example, here we're looking at videos uh, created by the company called Emerald Cloud Lab. Emerald is one of the first companies to provide these kinds of laboratory in the cloud services. You log into their system, you order up the specific experiments that you want, you pay a small fee, and then you download your data. My group is working directly with Emerald Cloud to provide machine learning and artificial intelligence capabilities so as to automate the process of interpreting and selecting the next experiment. I'm a computer scientist by training, and my research has been focused on computational structural biology and computational medicine. In particular, my goal is to design therapeutic proteins. When we first began, we quickly realized that generating high-quality data is actually challenging. Here, for example, um, is an experiment known as high-performance liquid chromatography, or HPLC. HPLC is a technique from analytic chemistry for separating, identifying, and quantifying the components of a mixture. And the basic idea is that your sample is going to be run across a column. And the properties of the material inside the column will affect the components of your mixture in ways such that different components will move through the columns at different rates. As the components uh, come off the column, they can be detected, giving rise to a chromatogram where you will have different peaks at uh, different retention times. These peaks correspond to different components of your mixture. However, the cartoon shown here makes it seem like generating such chromatograms is straightforward. In reality, there are a number of adjustable parameters in HPLC that can dramatically affect the quality of the chromatogram. So here we see the contrast between a poor chromatogram, this sort of blob with three humps in it, versus the ideal chromatogram where you have three well-resolved peaks. My group is now developing algorithms to automatically tune HPLC parameters so that we get high-quality uh, ch uh, chromatograms. And we're doing this in collaboration with Emerald Cloud Lab. We are running experiments and implementing software for doing this. A second example of the kind of project my group works on um, is protein design. Here we have an optimization problem, just like the previous application, but it's very different. Here we're trying to optimize a sequence so that the protein has a prescribed function. And to do this, we're working with a chemical engineer at Carnegie Mellon, and we're modifying an existing technique known as directed evolution uh, in order to design so-called protein polymer conjugates. A protein polymer conjugate is simply a protein to which a polymer has been attached. And the idea is that if you attach the right uh, polymer, you can change the function of a protein and literally engineer uh, new therapies or industrial enzymes, for example. And the basic procedure is illustrated here. You start off with a source gene. You introduce mutations in order to build a library. You then express the library 
and test for activity, you isolate promising uh, mutants and then you uh, modify those by introducing still more mutations. And the idea is that you go through this process several times in order to optimize your design. So conceptually, you can think of an abstract space, sequence space, where each point in the space is a unique sequence with a unique uh, fitness or um, objective value. And the idea is that through directed evolution, you can uh, find optimal designs. Now, the reality is that there are limitations to what can be done experimentally, and you certainly cannot test every design experimentally. So the role of my group is to develop algorithms that analyze existing data and make recommendations for which designs to test next. And in doing so, we hope to design an entire new generation of molecular chimeras that can be used in a variety of different applications. Clearly, HPLC optimization and protein design are very different tasks, but from a computational perspective, they're similar in that they involve optimizing some unknown black box function. HPLC optimization, for example, we can think of the unknown function denoted here by F as mapping the sample plus any uh, instrument settings to the chromatogram. And G is just some function that maps a chromatogram to a scalar value measuring, for example, resolution. Our goal then is to find the optimal uh, settings of the instrument that maximizes resolution. For protein polymer design, on the other hand, we have an optimization over both the protein sequence, S, and the choice of polymer, P. And the unknown function maps that particular pair to some measure of fitness, for example. Now, these are uh, functions that can, in principle, be evaluated by simply running an experiment. But running an experiment, of course, can be expensive and certainly time-consuming. So it would be helpful to have a computational method to help us prioritize which designs are worth testing in the lab. My group develops sequential Bayesian optimization methods to address problems like these and related ones. This is a conceptual overview of the kind of strategies that we employ. Here, SBO is an abstract method for performing sequential Bayesian optimization. It takes four arguments, f, f hat, t, and s. f is the unknown function. It's the thing that we can evaluate uh, for a cost uh, via an experiment. f hat is sometimes called the surrogate function, and it's an approximation to the true function. But it is assumed to be quick to evaluate, meaning that we can screen lots of designs in silico. T is our budget. It's the number of experiments we uh, can afford to run. And S is called the selector or acquisition function that helps us to decide which uh, experiment to actually run. And the basic overview is shown here. We just iterate through uh, the number of experiments. Uh, the first step is to find a design that optimizes our selector function. So here, the selector function is the Bayesian part of the approach. We're going to uh, take into consideration prior knowledge and our current uh, areas of uncertainty, and then find something that is uh, designed to give us the maximum expected improvement. Once we've chosen that design, we run the experiment to get the true value, and then update a data set D. We then use that data set to relearn our surrogate function f hat. And the idea, of course, is that it's supposed to get better over time. On the left-hand side, we see an animated GIF of this, this procedure. The idea is that we have some true unknown function that's represented by the black line here. And at any given time, we have a certain number of known data points. Those are the little black dots here. And the purple regions represent our uncertainty as to the true value of the function at different points in time. We can use our selector function to select the next point to uh, 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 sample. 
And that's why you're seeing more and more of these little black dots uh, being added. And in doing so, we learn more values of the function, and that helps us obtain a better estimate of the true function and therefore find the best design. On the bottom here, we see three different choices for the selector functions, uh, illustrating different trade-offs that you can make. Sometimes they agree with one another. Sometimes they disagree with one another. But for a given application domain, we will find the most appropriate selection function. So those are the kinds of applications and the kinds of methodologies that we develop. Once again, we're running actual experiments in collaboration with Emerald uh, Cloud Lab. But uh, this year, Carnegie Mellon has invested in some of its own automated facilities. So if you come to Carnegie Mellon, uh, you may be able to work on this automated uh, system that has a variety of different robots that allows us to do a variety of different kinds of uh, automated experiments.